live from Tampa Bay, this is the Big Cat Rescue. It's on, isn't it? <laughs> Presentation. We're Who are you? Wildlife. Oh, I'm Honey Waiton. I'm the gift shop manager and a master keeper here at Big Cat Rescue. Yeah. Hi, I don't get mood lighting like last time. Uh, yeah, I just was gonna wait until you were on to the. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh no, you yeah. don't have any mood lighting. Yeah, you know, do you? I don't have any mood lighting. Oh, that's fine. I'm just. But I'm gonna have to turn your light off. Did you guys see this okay, or do we need to turn light off? The light turn 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 off. I'll turn, turn light it off. off. Oh, and we're going dark. The more ways than one. Oh dear. Okay. Oh yes, we hear you. Okay. No. So, um, when I was an intern, and maybe it's just the way I thought, but I kind of felt like because I'm not a sanctuary, now my only options are sanctuary or zoo. That's all I could do. So I went on the AZA site, and they would have some sanctuary postings and everything else, looking for a job. Uh, that was before a job opened up here. Yay. Um, and so I got to thinking, potentially you guys, other interns, thought the same way. So I thought I would come up with a, um, a presentation that would kind of give you some other alternatives. So there are a lot of, oh yeah, I'm going to have to look like this because mine is not big enough to see what I'm doing. Oh, can I make it bigger? Hold on. Sorry, I haven't done it this way before. No, I can't. Okay. Um, so there are a lot of projects based in the U.S. There's also other organizations. So the first part, I'm going to talk about field um, work that is available, and there are many more of these as well. I just picked ones that are near and dear to my heart. And then um, there's a lot of different organizations in the U.S., and I'm also going to go over some um, international ones, too. And on some of these things, we actually have former volunteers, former interns that have moved on and gone to some of these entities as well. So... Um, Conservation canines and working dogs for conservation. They're very similar groups. Um, they're not necessarily interchangeable, but they do very similar things, so I just kind of lump them together. Um, then the Wind River Bear Institute up in Montana, Grand Teton Cougar Project in Wyoming, and the Yellowstone Wolf Project in Wyoming. If you're not sure that I love Yellowstone in Wyoming, just look at my computer um, or talk to me for five minutes. Um, and then the different organizations in the U.S., Defenders of Wildlife, the Nature Conservancy, the Audubon Society, and the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Yay, I said it right. And then um, the National Wildlife Federation. So we'll go over a couple of those little guys. I do not know how to make these bigger. Oh, really kind of freaking me out. Um, so in, within different states, um, they have DNR, which is the Department of Natural Resources. Um, most of the western states have that, some of the eastern states don't, but um, they have similar entities like we have FWC here. Um, there's also FWS, which is the um, Federal um, Wildlife Society. My brain just went dead for a second. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service, sorry, I knew that was wrong. Um, and then also sometimes DOT projects um, will work with wildlife as well. So there's a couple different things you can do. The international agencies that I'm going to talk about are Panthera, the World Wildlife Fund, ADI, Animal Defenders International, we know them well, um, IFOC, which is the International Fund for Animal Welfare, the Snow Leopard Trust, who we know and love as well, and the African Wildlife Foundation. So for U.S. fieldwork projects, we have the Conservation Canines, Working Dogs for Conservation, and Wind River um, Bear Institute. So if you guys have experience with dogs, you can also help work with wildlife. But pair the two together, it works out really, really well. Not only can you, or you could even go into um, the government with like the Beagle Brigade, going to um, uh, airports trying to make sure, you know, things don't come into the U.S. that shouldn't come into the U.S. So there's a lot of opportunity. Oh, I should probably turn my phone off. On silent. It'll ring because I'm doing something. Um, conservation canines and working dogs for conservation utilize dogs to find scat with poop, our favorite subject here at Big Cat Rescue. Um, so the reason they use them is they can um, do population studies, they can determine habitat stability, and they can find apex predators, as well as, as helping endangered species. It's one of the best ways to determine the strength of populations without being invasive to the species that you're studying. So they don't actually have to necessarily find the animals, they can just find their poop. And then from the poop, 
their handlers can see the strength of the diet for the animals. So if they've got a good prey base, so that helps determine the habitat sustainability, that kind of thing. So our cats actually helped with that. How do you think they did that? Yes, <laughs> we collected it in baggies. And we put it in little boxes and we mailed it out with dry ice. So we used um, some of our leopards, Sunny, Cheat, Reno, Jade, Armani, Jumanji, Saber, and Simba. The Lynx, Skipper, Gilligan, Natasha, and Willow. Um, Bobcats, Little Feather, Breezy, Apache, Divinity, Windstar, Will, Anna, Banshee, Cherokee, Little Dove, and a few others because we have a million Bobcats. Um, Servals, Ginger, Cricket, Kalahari, Serengeti, Servi, Nairobi, Nala, and others. Caracals, Rusty, Sassy, and Rose. Cougars, Aspen, Hal, Narla, Max, Toby, Sassy, Frass, Aries, Orion, and Artemis, Lions, all three of the Lions. And then we also had a couple of the Tigers take part. TJ, Ben, Nikita, Andre, Arthur, Amanda, and Zapu. And they all donated their poop very kindly. <laughs> so, got some pictures of some of our kids up there. Just found some fun photos and took that. I think we even got some from Canyon, too. So, the species that these guys are trained to um, find vary. They're lots of cat species, cougars, bobcats, lynx, cheetahs, lions, Asian leopards, so our Jade and Armani got to participate. Um, Afri or, I'm sorry, African leopards, so Jade and Armani got to participate. Um, Indo-Chinese tiger, jaguar, caracal serval, and bengal tiger. And then other species, which I put some of these up because you guys probably aren't as familiar with some of them. That first picture is a maned wolf. Really interesting. Um, gray wolf, Iberian wolf, coyote, wild dog, spotted hyena, wolverine, um, badger, and the funny little pool over there. Um, grizzly bears, brown bears, black bears, American pine martens, stone martens, minks, fishers, weasels, red foxes, uh, pocket mice and the Pacific water shrew. That's the little guy in the middle on the bottom. Um, there's also a Townsend's big eared bat in the middle on the top, the salamander, and then the little guy on the left is a swift fox. Um, they've also done barred owls um, and uh, tapers, orcas. You train them to tr smell orca poop on the water. I'm not really sure how that works, but it does. Um, sea turtle nest and the silver spot frass, which is actually a <clears throat> so here's some of the canines in action. They use all kinds of different breeds. Um, they get their little vests and they get to go out in the woods and have fun and find poop, which, you know, dogs have a great sense of smell, so it works out well. So where do these dogs come from? Um, they rescue dogs from um, shelters, usually the high energy dogs that aren't going to get um, adopted as easily because they're a lot of work. Uh, so it saves money that would otherwise be euthanized since they need more attention and they're harder to get adopted. Um, they also use the dogs that don't make it through other canine programs. Um, so if you flunk out of you know, police canine school, you can go work for them. Um, they also use a variety of breeds and mutts. As long as the dog will work for the reward of that little red ball that he's got up there. That's their favorite thing after they find the poop, they go play with the ball. So lots of different breeds. We've got a Jack Russell, we've got a Lab, got a Pitbull mix, a uh, German Shepherd, and a Border Collie. So kind of everybody. And uh, Scooby is one of the stars. He is a um, Lab, Black Lab, and he had a really successful day with that London poop that he found. <laughs> and then he's got his little ball toy to play with. So <clears throat> dogs can also be used to manage wildlife. Uh, the Carilion Bear Dog Project does this. They actually are a Finnish dog that was originally bred to hunt bears. Um, so what they do now is this um, particular entity, and they're all nonprofits. This nonprofit uses them to help set up parameters for bears to um, leave the area. They take um, uh, habituated bears to people, they put them out, and they set up the dogs to start barking. And there's something about the frequency and the tone of the bark of the dog that the bears don't want to be anywhere near it. So um, <clears throat> they're actually relocating grizzly bears by doing that, and they've been really successful. We have fewer than a thousand grizzly bears in the lower 48 states, so if you can save any of them, it's really helpful. Um, and then they relocate the bears instead of destroying them. So that's really crucial to their survival. But you can't have grizzly bears that are just used to wandering up into you know, people's houses and stuff because grizzlies are scary. Um, the dogs aren't that big. They're about 50 to 70 pounds, so you can kind of see 
next to a person, how big they are, kind of a medium-sized dog, um, but they're fierce and they're willing to take on bears many times their size. So they're kind of a fluffy, you know, finish would be cold there, so they need to be fluffy. Okay. So they use culvert traps to put the bears in and to relocate them. They'll, they'll um, tranquilize them, then put them in the traps, and then drive them to wherever they want to relocate them. Take the bears along. Um, the dogs will bark at the bears in the traps at the release, at the release locations, and then that helps <clears throat> set up an area that the bears will disperse from and not return to. Um, actually, really successful. Something about that pitch and that frequency and that tone. So this is how they do it. They pull the doors. Sometimes the doors are guillotine doors, just like ours are. Sometimes they fling open. Just depends. Um, and it works on grizzlies and black bears. Obviously, this is a black bear. Um, but they have the dogs barking and kind of harassing them, and then the bears don't want to come back into the area. So works out really well. Um, when I was out in Seattle for the <clears throat> chemical immobilization class last year, um, Rich was there with Jax, one of the um, curly bear dogs, and he had a culvert trap so we could kind of look at it and see exactly how everything worked. <coughs> this is on their website, Wind River Bear Institute's website, and this is a big, huge grizzly bear, and there's a couple of dogs not that far from it just barking at it. So it will go away and leave the area. Don't ask me, but it, it works. So I like that. Teacher bears well, like, like you can do that. But. So the next um, entity is the Grand Teton Cougar Project, and it's sponsored by Panthera. We have been sponsored by Panthera. Um, they sponsored Jumanji and Saber, I think, Black Leopards. And um, so we have kind of a working partnership with them. This is based in the southern um, greater Yellowstone ecosystem. I don't know what that was, um, which is in and around Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and Panthera's Teton Project, Cougar Project, is focused on collecting comprehensive data about the behavior and ecology of pumas. It was launched in 2001. The program has collared and monitored more than 130 individual pumas, cougars, and is one of the few long-term cougar projects ever conducted. They use satellite GPS collars, <clears throat> motion-triggered cameras, and other novel research methods. The scientists are tracking uh, cougar movements, recording new behaviors in the wild, and identifying dens. They're also monitoring the kittens from an early age. Um, the project's current focus includes population dynamics, habitat selection, foraging ecology, interactions with other carnivores, which includes wolves now that they've been reintroduced to Yellowstone, mm -hmm. and the social behaviors and organization of the cougars. Um, so it's a really kind of overly comprehensive project. So camera traps can get lots of footage, a mom and a cub, and yes, they are spotted. You guys didn't know the cubs when they were little, but they were spotted, had big blue eyes. Everybody kept asking when their eyes were going to change, because we'd never seen cubs before. <laughs> so camera traps are really non-invasive, and that's a really great way to just get information. You can see social behaviors, different things like that. So this was captured um, with cubs playing. Just a really easy thing, just you know, snaps a picture, doesn't even spook them really. Um, then they also will collect data from the animals in the wild to uh, fit them with collars. So radio collaring is a great tool to track the movements of specific individuals. It'll tell you if um, territories are overlapping, things like that. It also can identify when it's a female, if she's starting to den, if they think she's pregnant, she's starting to den, so she'll have um, kittens. Um, and then it's a good way to see how differently males and females disperse. Um, Coloring will also tell scientists if home ranges overlap and what territories individuals are traversing. So, really kind of neat, kind of harsh weather situations there, but got to do what you got to do. What do you do? They also use carry tarps um, to weigh the cougars while they're sedated in the field. Um, so it's a really safe way to do that. It also provides a layer between the snow while they're knocked out. So um, they don't sedate them for very long. So it's not a sit. It's not the same sedation we would do for a surgery. It's the one that's reversal, whatever that is, Justin, but it's, it's easier to reverse. <clears throat> but you gotta do your work pretty quickly. Um, they also do radio telemetry. This, uh, those are GPS colors that they're using for Panthera, but radio telemetry is the radio colors, and so it's a little bit harder. You hold your little antenna up and you listen for the pings for the um, frequency that you're listening for, and as they get louder and more close together, you know, you're getting closer to your individual. Um, 
the, the radio collars are a little more economical, um, so it makes it a little bit easier to work with. The GPS collars are still quite expensive, um, but they collect data a whole lot easier and a lot more. So field work can be hard, but depending on where you are, the rewards are really cool because the views are really amazing, especially if you're anywhere near Yellowstone. Mm. Um, that picture is Grand Prismatic in Yellowstone, and Yellowstone has the most geothermal activity on the face of the planet in one area. So, really interesting place. Why didn't you click? Thank you. So, the Yellowstone Wolf Project. So, what they have basically done in, they started in 95, so in 22 years, uh, the picture on the left is when they were eradicating wolves in the 20s from Yellowstone, just shot on sight no matter what, because, and it was even the Park Service helping, their, their overarching idea was predators were bad, which is just the opposite of how it should be, because predators help control populations and do what nature intended. Um, from the picture on the left, which is the eradication, to bringing in um, wolves from Canada in the middle, and then now people flock to Yellowstone in the droves to set up their spotting scopes and look for wolves. Um, so the project began in 95, and it was to reintroduce gray wolves into the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, they'd been absent for about nine, 70 years or so at the time. The elk and the mule deer populations were huge, and thousands of the ungulates, which are hoofed animals, were just dying. They were starving to death in the winter because of overgrazing. Um, I was there in 94, right when this was kind of starting, they were building the pens to bring the wolves into at the time, and uh, the, mm, and the, um, sorry folks, come back to life, thank you. Um, uh, and you could actually see the animals just did not look that healthy, that you could see the browse lines of exactly how high they could reach and where they were eating, so. Um, it's really important to get these guys back in. 14 wolves were captured in Canada and relocated and introduced into Yellowstone. Um, they were penned for a time and fed carcasses from animals that died in the park, and then they were released into the park. So they did a soft release, um, similar to kind of what we do with our rehab bobcats, as opposed to a hard release, which would have just been catching them and throwing them out into the wilds of Yellowstone without them knowing what kind of food prey base was there or anything. So this is a picture of bison in Yellowstone, and at the time, you can kind of see the ribs on that bison. You should not be able to do that if it's uh, a well-fed population. So this is an older picture of before the wolves were reintroduced. <clears throat> this man is Doug Smith, and that is a sedated wolf, <laughs> just so you know. He's not just running around grabbing wolves and making them grin. Um, he's the head of the project, and he is the wolf man. He's the, he's the dude. Um, he's the reason that wolves are thriving in the park again. Um, and then the system is moving, the ecosystem is moving back into balance. He's also the co-author of the book Decade of the Wolf, which I own, surprise, surprise. Um, it's a really good read. <laughs> Look how big that wolf is. <laughs> he's not a small guy. Um, some of the wolves have even just, they will specifically predate bison. The molly pack, which is what this set of wolves is, and they predate bison almost specifically. Nobody really knows why but they do a good job of it. And you see how big that bison is compared to how small those wolves are? So, um, this was the Drew Peak Pack. They are the most famous pack that has been in the, um, the, in the reintroduced um, set of packs. Um, they died out in 2010. They, were, they had mange in the winter. And they, the Wolf Project has taken very much of a hands off. They don't really want to intervene um, because they won't let nature just go back to how it should be. So they monitor and they knew that they had mange, but they didn't step in and they slowly um, passed away and died out in 2010. Some of the descendants have survived and they live on in the other packs, but this was the most famous pack. It's also why my <clears throat> dog who passed away was named Drew Peak from these guys. He looked like some of them too. There were five original packs that were released. The Crystal Creek Molly's, Molly's pack was named after one of the researchers. Her name was Molly. Um, so the Butte Pack, which these are all, the others are all um, regionally where they were in the park. And then the Druid Peak Pack, there's actually a mountain called Druid Peak. Um, it actually split off into four different pack or three more packs. Um, the Geode Creek, Agate Creek, and the Buffalo Fork. The Rose Creek Pack, um, and then the Leopold Pack. This, the five at the top are the originals, and the Leopold Pack is starred because 
It's the first natural pact to form in Yellowstone since the eradication 70 years ago. Um, they've also formed the Canyon Butte Pack, um, has formed, that had formed when I was out there uh, three years ago, and I got to spend the day hiking them around looking for them <laughs> in the snow and the cold. Um, this is a 2010 uh, territories kind of overlap. Sorry, you couldn't make it any bigger. Um, but there were 10 active part uh, active packs in the park. It's not easy to say. In 2015, um, some individuals in the Mollies uh, pack are descendants of the Druids, and three of the original packs are still represented while new packs have formed. Um, Yellowstone is very large. It's 2.2 million acres, um, but some of the packs still venture outside the borders. So um, supporters are trying to create buffer zones to be introduced to help protect those wolves that leave the, the borders of the park um, because the anti-wolf people, like we have anti-BCR people, they are now shooting collared wolves specifically as trophy kills um, because they know they're important to reintroducing the species and helping save it and they don't want it there, um, <clears throat> which is really sad. So. This is the coolest thing anybody ever remembered from my talk the last time, so we are going to play this video again because it's great if I can figure out how to get my little mouse to go back up there. There we go. Here we go. Exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years. That the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they would managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers uh, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes. And as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed in it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. Here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. 
And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transform not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. So that old saying that one person can make a difference, one species can make a huge difference, especially if it's an apex predator because they become uh, umbrella species and they control the things that happen with all the others. So this is the northern entrance to the park, it's the Roosevelt Arch, um, and as a result of all of uh, Doug Smith's hard work, 99 wolves now result re reside in 10 packs in Yellowstone National Park. There are 510 wolves in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and there are 1,780 in the greater Northern Rockies. So they're not, they've delisted them, which is the dumbest thing ever, because they're not recovered in any great numbers, but um, ranchers don't like them. <clears throat> so the state agencies, they do uh, employ lots of wildlife biologists and zoologists. Um, in many different ways, the Department of Natural Resources is actually tasked with um, doing multiple use for state land, um, government land. So that means hunting, fishing, recreation, all of that. It's a big, it's a balance between wildlife and, and people using it. Um, so it's a little interesting. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Service, which has the law enforcement part of uh, the, uh, the agency. And then the D Department of Transportation, um, many states are now using wildlife transit areas to help lower the amount of wildlife um, being killed by vehicles. And I have some pictures of what that looks like. So a lot of those are underpasses. Um, they also have a fence built on this one too. Um, but the underpasses seem to work better, I think, mainly because they're probably a little bit cooler. Just like our cats like going in their dens when it's hot. I have a feeling that they like to go underground. Might be a little bit easier. So I found some images on some camera traps of some animals using these. So we've got a moose, we have multiple moose, moose, still the same plural, um, and mooses, <laughs> it's moose, and then um, there's a grizzly bear, it's not mooses either, um, grizzly bear using it, and also a little bobcat, a little blurry because he's probably moving a little bit faster, but it's really cool to see some of these animals using these things, and it's a really simple way to help them. Um, the domestic or organizations that I'm going to talk about are Defenders of Wildlife, the Audubon Society, Animal Legal Defense Fund, and the National Wildlife Federation. Um, so you can see what they deal with. Um, Defenders of Wildlife deals with predators, which is interesting because a lot of other places don't. Everybody likes the cute little furry animals, cute little cuddly guys, and predators are actually really important, as we've just seen. Um, so I like that they, that they work with these guys. Um, these are some of the species that they work with. Um, on the ground, at the state level and the local level, they develop practical, innovative programs that protect and restore key species like wolves, eagles, polar bears, um, to habitats and inform the national policy work. Um, with the state, the national and international policymakers to secure laws and policies that protect the animals and their habitats. They are widely recognized by their peers and policymakers for the effectiveness of their advocacy work. We don't know anything about that. Um, particularly with the Department of the Interior and Department of Ag, and are known for being the most effective advocate for wildlife funding in the federal appropriations process. So that's kind of cool. What and is the that corpse, little animal right there? The little guy the on the left? left? Yeah. It's an Arctic fox. I know, I picked some really odd animals just because I figured we wouldn't be that, that aware of them or know what they were. So I was like, I'll point it out. Thank you for asking. 
Um, in the courts, they established legal safeguards for native wildlife and they're fighting efforts to roll back environmental protections. Um, they act as, hello mouse, as legal counsel on behalf of a population segment that cannot act for itself, which is the wildlife of North America. Um, and that is their link, defenders.org. The Audubon Society basically works with birds. Um, they are separated into chapters and each chapter is committed to certain things. Um, there's state and local, um, there's state and regional chapters. Um, they advocate for the protection of birds and their habitat by supporting local, state, national, and hemispheric conservation priorities. They offer birding field trips, they identification classes, and worldwide travel for members of the public. They engage children, like you can see down on the right, that's actually doing a Christmas bird count. Um, they engage children and adults in a wild, wide, I can't talk, assortment of educational programs. They also coordinate out, outreach events, including birding festivals. Um, they create bird-friendly communities in your backyard by helping people know how to do that. Um, and then they also provide data on the health of local bird species through Christmas bird counts and the Great Backyard Bird Count, breeding bird surveys, and other local um, projects. And they adopt and protect important bird areas. So on the top right, that is actually a banded bird, and they're just doing um, measurements uh, so they can see how that actual individual looks. Um, they probably have a whole count going where they're keeping track of certain species and how those in that area look. Um, those counts help with population estimates and they also do bird banding which helps scientists know individuals. So that bird is banded. You can see at the very top he's got a little pink band on. Um, you have to be licensed to band birds. Um, and then they all go on to a registry. Um, and they're link is Audubon.org. Most of them are going to be pretty easy. It's going to be whatever their name is, .org. Um, so the Animal Legal Defense Fund, really great uh, entity. Um, I just grabbed some of their little promotional pieces there. Um, the ALDF works to eliminate animal cruelty through prosecuting offenders. Um, so they work through the court systems. Uh, they're working on shutting down roadside zoos, ending puppy mills, ending animal research, Freeing Lolita the orca and freeing Tony the tiger, who we know about and would love to be able to help with <laughs> and have offered to help with. Um, and theirs is ALDF.org. Then the National Wildlife Federation, they kind of help everybody. Um, they go from habitats to wetlands to specific species. Um, they're trying to work to sustain habitats, basically. So they deal with waters, coastal, and floodplains. Gulf restoration, which was important after um, Katrina and then Hurricane Sandy up north. Um, public lands, tribal lands, forests and farms. They also work hard to establish young conservationists through their magazines. That's why I got Ranger Rick up there, because I <laughs> loved Ranger Rick magazine. When you're a kid, you don't get mail. So every <laughs> month, I got a Ranger Rick magazine, and I waited for that to come, and I just, just was super excited about it. Um, so you never know. Get your kids Ranger Rick magazines. <laughs> they can become crazy people like me. Um, and theirs is um, nwf.org. So there are a couple international organizations that I'm going to focus on. Panthera, World Wildlife Fund, ADI, IFAW, Snow Leopard Trust, and the African Wildlife Federation. So Panthera does specifically cats, and they're in 47 countries. They are working lions, tigers, leopards, cheetahs, cougars, jaguars, and snow leopards. So in the field, they are sedating and collaring and getting information from a leopard there. And then they have camera traps. Those are jaguars. That's a mom with cubs over here. And then a lion on the plains. Um, and they're panthera.org. So I, we can, I got a page at the end that kind of gives you all of this information so you guys can snag that. World Wildlife Fund, we actually have had a former intern go and work for World Wildlife Fund. She's been to Thailand and lots of other places in Asia, all kinds of crazy places, cool things. So I grabbed one of theirs. I love the, the um, rhino, I'm not medicine, the elephant, I'm not a trinket, and the tiger, I'm not a rug. Um, they're fighting you know, some of the stereotypes in Asia that these animals have mystical powers and their bones have healing medicinal you know, abilities and they just don't. Um, they work specifically with a certain species, polar bears, 
whales, giant pandas, sea turtles, tigers, rhinos, gorillas, and elephants. I like that. Have an elephantastic birthday. That's just funny. And it's more wildlife fun that works. Don't do WWF because that's a whole different thing. <laughs> With wrestling. <laughs> it's a little bit different. Um, ADI, we're familiar with them. Um, they're Animal Defenders International. And uh, we recently went and saw Lion Ark, which was about the 33 Bolivian lions that they helped rescue. Um, they've rescued some more that actually got repatriated back to South Africa, which was great. Um, the Bolivian tigers went to um, Colorado, out to Pat Craig, and this is how they found these guys. Um, they are working in America, Europe, Africa, and South America to try to shut down circuses, things like that. Um, so the lioness in the top, that's the cage she was in in this family circus. That other on the top right, that those lions have been breeding and those lions all lived in one transport cage <laughs> all together um clawed everything the boys in the bottom left here extremely aggressive when they put that they had to put the food in with with shovels through the little floppy deal um it was kind of terrifying um but it was really interesting to see the, the film and see what they did um obviously they're the people that brought us hoover um and uh so they are doing some pretty amazing work um, they had to hunt down the roadside circuses. Uh, they found Hoovers. There were 12 cats that were originally there, Carol, is that right? With yes. Hoover? And then the people went to ground because they found out they were being chased. Eight months later, they finally found him again, and Hoover was the only one that was still there. Um, so our handsome boy um, in the transport, in the circus there, um, they had a whole hashtag, get Hoover home, meet Hoover. Um, he got transported in a giant cargo plane with flowers because it was close to Mother's Day. And um, he flew into Miami Airport and then a group, went, a group of us went down and met him and brought him back. And he went from where he was in that cave, tiny cage to this lovely picture that Jamie took um, in his big, huge enclosure there. So that one's a little close to home. And we actually have a former volunteer who works with Lion Art, or with um, ADI. We were at the movie and just talking to people and she turned around and she was like, oh my gosh, I was like, oh my gosh, Shiloh. Had no idea. So, you never know. Um, International Fund for Animal Welfare, they do some pretty cool work too. They're rescuing a dolphin there on that right hand side. Um, they work with big bear, uh, with bears, big cats, cetaceans, which are marine mammals, elephants, foxes, penguins, Seals, that's why I got the seal up there. Raptors, which are birds of prey, turtles, rhinos, and wolves. Um, and they're ifaw.org. Um, we've actually worked with them in Ethiopia. They were um, uh, starting, or running, needed help running a sanctuary, and Catherine wound up heading to uh, Ethiopia to help them with that. So, some of these places, we've actually worked with some of these entities. Um, Snow Leopard Trust is amazing. They, uh, do some really cool work with a really cool species. Um, we had three snow leopards that lived here and even though they don't live here anymore, we still par partner with them, kind of it's a way to honor our snow leopards and we are their second highest purchaser of products to sell to the public that helps with snow leopard um, uh, conservancy, my words. Um, so this is a camera trap picture down the bottom and then they're collaring a, uh, uh, a snow leopard up on the top. That camera shop is actually on a magnet. You'll see it in the part in the gift shop. So they were actually one of the first companies or entities to do something really smart and partner with the community. Um, they're based in Seattle, so they're an American com they're an American organization. And a lot of times, I think we go around and say, "You guys should do this," and they go, "You don't know who we are. Why are you telling us what to do?" So what they did is they went into the community and they very smartly asked them, what do you need? What would work? And so um, one of the things they do is Snow Leopard Enterprises, which is all of the items that we have in the gift shop that is from the Snow Leopard Trust. Um, they started making those things. They're using yak wool and, and Mongolian sheep uh, wool uh, to make these very interesting items that are great fun for your cats to play with because they smell really interesting. Um, and they also, uh, talk to the farmers. Um, what was happening is snow leopards were killing um, some of their herding animals, which 
um, was a huge loss because they might make three hundred dollars a year, um, and if they lost you know part of their herd, they're going to try to go find that snow leopard and kill it. And so, by partnering with the community, they actually made these people understand there aren't snow leopards in most of the world, and um, if we make a way for you to make more money from just from more things than just your farming, um, would that be good? And they said sure. So they also helped um, with that. They also helped ensure stock, which they wanted, um, immunize immunize their stock as well because sometimes they would die from disease. And so they did several community partner programs, and it actually has been a really good success. So now those people are less likely to kill snow leopards, and they're actually more. Um, interested in helping save them. They also realize they're really not found all over the world. Um, another great way for them to get information is camera traps, but you gotta hide them a little bit more interestingly because as you can see, not a whole lot of vegetation where these guys live. So you stack up some rocks and you hide a camera and then the snow leopard comes along and finds it. But they get some really fun images from that. Like, oh, I'm coming up, I'm coming up. Oh wait, what was that? So, um, comes in very handy. And just like Jamie, um, how she takes pictures of the insides of the legs and stuff for the, for the bobcats, they do a similar thing so they can actually identify individuals and cats. Um, even if they're not collared, they can tell who they are um, as they pass these uh, camera traps. It comes in very, very handy. And there's snowleopard.org is there. Um, African Wildlife Foundation. They work with elephants, wild dogs, rhinos, leopards, giraffes, which is interesting. They're one of the only ones that did giraffes. Um, lions, apes, and many ungulates, which are hoofed animals, so all the crown horns and things like that, gazelles. Um, they're actively working to prevent poaching all across Africa. Um, in Cameron, they have, um, they have patrols that actually go around and try to keep uh, poachers out. Part of the problem is they have plenty of land and they have plenty of habitat. They don't have enough um, guards to help with the poaching pro problem. Um, you know, rhinos are being poached just astronomically, and so are elephants. Um, with a better understanding of the specific community needs, they're implementing projects like rainwater tanks, which is deterring people from going into the forest to collect water and causing deforestation. So some simple things um, that they can do that can help with that um, works out really nicely. And they're awf.org. And then the very last slide that I have is the Wildlife Career Jobs links. And that, if you just type in Wildlife Career Job, those links will pop up and you guys can find all kinds of cool stuff, either in the US or abroad. Um, so it works out quite nicely. Do you guys have any questions? Can somebody turn the light on, please? Yeah, because I can't see anything but my screen. <laughs> Good idea. Good idea. <laughs> Yes. So I have two questions. Yes. So when they released the wolf population back into Yellowstone, did they already have, like, take wolves that were already in a pack, or did they just take wolves that they could get and kind of reintroduce? There were a couple from um, areas that were similar. Yeah. So they had a breeding pair, mm -hmm. and then I think they had another breeding pair. Oh, okay. So they kind of dispersed and made, like, mm -hmm. a couple packs that way. Um, but yeah, they only had 14 individuals that they started with. Okay. So, so that's really um, cool how they like. It's amazing, yeah. I'll know a little bit more in sometime this month when I get my whole genealogy of all the Yellowstone wolves because I bought myself that for Christmas. And then I also figured it would also be a birthday present because it would be coming in May. So it worked out nicely for me. And then what's your second question? Second question is, I don't know if you know this or even Doug who just in. Because um, since you said that they were shooting the wolves that were collared, and then I know a lot of researchers are collaring animals, um, like obviously to find them. Would it be better to chip them since they don't have like that, I guess that collar around their body? I and think it's a way to hide, I guess. The I think as purpose? the technology gets better, they probably will. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, that's kind of, I mean the GPS collars are expensive right yeah. now. So the chips are even more expensive. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I think as the technology gets better, that price will come down and they'll be able to do more stuff like that. Oh, or you have to be within three feet of the chip. Yeah. Is that how it is? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because I, like, I know they like chip, like, you know, 
Yeah. All, obviously, like domestic cats and dogs. So. And they may start. Yeah, but you, you're scanning them yeah, right so there. That's like, yeah. Like, walk up to a wolf. Here, let me scan you. <laughs> <laughs> um, or a grizzly bear. Let me scan you. Um, what they might do is start um, tagging them differently. Okay. I know with the bears, they tag their ears, sort of mm-hmm. like they do cattle sometimes. Yeah. But again, that is something really bright, and you can see it from way far off. Yeah. So they may start changing that with people. Because isn't it? Yeah, but yeah. would it be like possible with? You know these cats or dogs like wolves having these colors like will that affect you know like the mating process because they kind of doesn't seem to do any of that or their movements or anything like that the only thing it does is have mean people decide to shoot them okay which is unfortunate yes ma'am um when they were trying to you know try and collect some wolf spring down and reintroduce them were they limited to the number of individuals they could take because 14 seems like it might create a genetic bottleneck, and that doesn't make much sense with so much land. I think they did it from all across Canada. I don't think it was just one specific area. Um, so, you know, they're about genetic diversity, obviously, as well. So, And then there are Rockies wolves moving back and forth. There are some Canadian wolves now coming down, too. So they have lots of genetic diversity now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a matter of having the entrance and egress to be able to do that. So... I'm just wondering the reasoning behind 14. It just seems like a quite a I don't know why they picked 14, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> just 7 and 7. I don't know. Maybe okay. lucky number. I don't know. I don't know yes, ma'am. Uh, you had a page up that showed the first five packs that mm-hmm. were reintroduced, and then the seventh one was the Leopold, and that was the one that has um, come up kind of on its own and mm-hmm. wasn't originally introduced. There was another pack that had an asterisk by it, and it was one of the... It was a Druid Peak pack. The Druids got so big that they couldn't remain a pack. There were 16 individuals at one point, and that's a very large pack. Mm -hmm. And so they started to split off. And they kind of broke off, and they actually wound up breaking up into four. The original stayed, and then three more packs were created from those guys. So a pair, a pair, and a pair went and started their own packs. Because there were just way too many of them. Yeah, 16 is a huge... Mm -hmm you know, to keep together. So they didn't stay together that long. Anybody else? All right, thank you. I know they were having some technical difficulties, so they're waiting for me to put it up on YouTube because a lot of people said they it just kept freezing for them. Oh. Uh, well, actually, there is a question from Tanya. She says, what is a normal pack size for wolves? Um, should be between 6 and 10 individuals. That would be good. And then the, once they get bigger than that, they start to break off and make smaller packs. And Diana came in late and said, who are you? Who am I? <laughs> <laughs> the great and powerful Oz. No. Um, uh, my name is Honey Waiton, and I'm the gift shop manager here, and I'm also a master keeper. Um, and I have a degree in wildlife science and management from Auburn University. So, where you go to all my Auburn people out there? <laughs> <laughs> Cynthia Boatwright said, nice job. And Diana said, you did a great job. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs>